Good morning and welcome to our morning service today. It's great to have you with us. Thank you so much for sharing with us and joining us wherever you're watching this and whenever you're watching this. Uh, we start a new series today, uh, looking at some let us statements from Hebrews chapter 10. And we'll come to that a little bit later. Also today we are revisiting our lessons from lockdown. And we have a very original title called More Lessons from Lockdown. And we'll have that a little bit later in our service. Just for notices, for those who are regularly part of our family and are part of our community, if you'd like to join us for coffee afterwards, uh, we can't do it literally, but you can join us on Zoom and we can at least see each other on, and catch up and uh, you're very welcome to do that. We meet to pray tomorrow morning and uh, this week also with small groups on Wednesday and Thursday meeting up to connect again. Um, all of those are on Zoom and would encourage you, if you want to get links for those, let, get in touch and we can provide you with the links uh, and, and the invitations to those services and uh, those activities. This is Lent and we're during, during Lent we are doing Lent again differently uh, to, to what we have done in, in previous years. The last two or three years we've encouraged you to do the 40 Acts. That's different this year. We are putting a, a series of videos on our website. So if you go to uh, the Barmore Baptist Church website, you'll find on there uh, an Advent, uh, so a Lent grid, similar to the Advent one we did before Christmas. And you can click on the videos when they pop up each uh, on, the, on the two or three times a week and watch those. So there's uh, a new one going up today. And so please do check in and watch those videos as they appear. The psalmist David wrote these words in Psalm 28. He says, To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I shall be like those who go down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands towards your most holy place. And it's as we come drawn near to God, as we uh, come close to God as we lift our hands in worship to him and call out upon his name, then he hears us. So as we come to worship this morning, however you're feeling, whatever you're experiencing, whatever week you've had, draw near to him, worship him, lift your hearts and your voices to him and call upon his name. And as you worship him, he will meet you. And that's our prayer. We're going to sing our opening song, which is, kind of picks up that theme. Come, now is the time to worship. Come just as you are to worship. Let's draw near to him in our worship time this morning. Come, now is the time to worship. Now is the time to give your heart Come, just as you are to worship Come, just as you are before your God Still a great 
time to worship Come, now is the time to give your heart Come, just as you are to In our prayers, we're going to pray for our churches around us, as we do each week. And we're going to pray too for the Eastern Baptist Association, for our regional team, and also for the church at Colchester Road in Ipswich. They're asking us to pray for them, uh, like many of the churches around in our association, for the same kind of things, the same kind of themes coming week in, week, in, week out. For those who are on the edges of their communities, for those who are struggling to connect, for, for God to lead at this time, as they seek to be wise to how... Uh, to connect well and to look after their community, to reach into their community, and for wisdom going forward as what coming out of lockdown looks. So this information is there, and uh, really just ask us to continue to pray for them as a church community. Uh, the minister there is Jerry Brown. He's the lead minister, and they've got a strong team there working with Jerry. So we're going to pray for the church at Colchester Road in Ipswich uh, this morning. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather to worship together today. Thank you that we can come as we are, come with all our frailties, with our questions, with our doubts, with our concerns, with our uh, joys as well. Thank you that we can draw near to you. And as we lift our voices to you, as we lift our hands to you, as David the psalmist encouraged us to do, may you meet us and may you encourage us. Father God, we offer this time to you. We pray that you would bless us as we share in this time together remotely. But Lord, wherever we are and whenever we're watching this, Lord, would you indeed, by your spirit, be with us. We thank you for our fellowship with other churches around us in the city of Cambridge. We pray, particularly those in this area, for the folk at Fenderton Parish Church, those at St Vincent de Paul, at Christ Redeemer, at City Church and Christ Church. As we continue to serve together and work together and, and partner together for the sake of the gospel, Lord, would you bless our relationships one with another, deepen our love for each other, we pray. And guide us for our relationships with our local Baptist churches. We thank you for that. And we pray too, Father God, for uh, our association, for our regional team of Beth and Graham and Nick and Haley. Guide and lead them, we pray, for Janiah as she uh, chairs and moderates uh, the association. Father God, guide her, we pray too. And Father God, we pray for Colchester Road Baptist Church this morning. We pray for Jerry, the lead minister there, for the team that work with him for that church as it seeks to serve in that community in Ipswich. Guide them, lead them, we pray. As they seek to care for those on the margins, those who are vulnerable, those who are struggling in the community, and lead them to be effective in that, we pray. As they look to the future, guide them as to what coming out of lockdown will look like for them as a church. Bless them, we pray. We thank you for our partnership with, the, with, uh, with uh, these churches across our region and our associations. And uh, we do pray that you would continue to be with us as we seek to, to be an encouragement to others. So Father, we offer this time to you. We thank you so much for your presence with us now. Lead us and guide us, we pray. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to hand over now to Steve, who's going to introduce more lessons from lockdown, the first of our latest videos. Thank you, Steve. Welcome to our new series of more lessons from lockdown. Last summer, we, we did a series of lessons from lockdown, and many people found that helpful. So we're repeating it with more lessons. And today, our first guest is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Giles. And the first question, related to the earlier ones, but is, what have you found hardest about this prolonged lockdown? Mm, you mean, apart from the hairdressers being closed? Well, along with that, I mean, I <laughs> suffer from that too, obviously, but... Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, lots and lots. Um, 
I suppose, I mean, this is this is February half term. I would normally be involved with some of my grandchildren this time and over the over the year quite a lot. Um, and so that's that's been really hard. Um, and then seeing other people, meeting people for meals and seeing people in church. These are the things just being with being with other people as opposed to seeing you all online. Hmm. Yeah. OK, so that that is all quite difficult. Um, mm. Have you had any unexpected benefits that you've experienced during the lockdown? Well, yes, because although I was fairly, um, I don't know, fairly sceptical, I suppose, about how how online um, meetings would work, um, there, there are some advantages. And um, yeah, so in our small group, we've met every week. Um, and I feel as though I've got to know people quite a bit more through that. Some people aren't able to come, unfortunately, but um, the ones that are able to come, I feel we've, we've got to know one another more. Um, and certainly with my international groups, I do two international conversation groups. Um, in one of them, it now means that we don't have to be limited just to the people who are in Cambridge. So we can connect with people from all over the world. Um, that is exciting um, and, yeah, unexpected. Mm. So these are the things, yeah. Mm. Okay, good, good. So there are some benefits. And yeah. uh, have you learned anything about God during lockdown that you... You know, maybe as a surprise and, and, and something that you didn't know before? Well, if you'd looked at my diary um, at the beginning of 2020, 2019, or whatever year, you would have seen that it would be packed with things that I was planning to do. Um, but of course, last year, we weren't able to do the things that we wanted to do. So, but I, I think God has been saying to me, you know, you're all too ready to set your own agenda um, and to make your plans and to do what you want to do. But are you really listening to what I want you to do? Um, so there's been a lot of space to think through that one. Mm. So I think that that's been one of the things that that I've I've focused on. What is what is God saying at this time rather than what's next on the agenda for me? Mm. yeah and then again I think it's been hard for all of us to to think about you know the the what ifs oh what if what if I never see my grandchildren again what if um I can't travel anymore all of these things go through our minds and so I've had to really accept from God that he only gives strength and grace for today tomorrow is not guaranteed for anyone um and so to to really focus on on god for today um, and trust him for tomorrow is something i've really had to to do it's not easy all the time no no not easy but then mm. i guess the most important lessons are generally the ones which are a bit more challenging and difficult yeah and there's a there's one more thing that um that i've been aware of and so you know that I have connections with areas of the world where the church is persecuted, and I've often thought about those people. And we we really struggle, don't we, to that we can't meet together um, and we can't sing hymns when even the few times we have been together we can't sing, um, we can't have cups of coffee and things like that. But in the persecuted church, they can never do these things. And yet many of them are, are faithful to God and faithful to one another. So that's been a challenge to me um, to identify somewhat with the persecuted church. But they don't, most of them don't have Zoom or, or any online facilities. So, yeah, I'm counting my blessings um, and trying to remember to pray more for people who are in an even worse situation. Elizabeth there just sh shared with us uh, about the encouragements that we can find and, and that need to just keep our eyes focused upon 
the one who provides for us day in, day out, to keep a focus on the reasons that we have for worship today. And we're going to sing that song, 10,000 Reasons, Bless the Lord, O oh My Soul, as we're reminded of the many blessings that God gives us this day. Let's worship him together. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sin like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the So this week, Josh started with us on placement. Um, unfortunately, he hasn't physically been able to get to Cambridge uh, yet. He's coming here this weekend, and so as of this weekend, he will be here in Cambridge, and therefore will be able to uh, be part of what we're doing here at the church and in our community. So he will likely see some of you at various times over the next few weeks. 
And it's a real privilege for us to have Josh with us and he's met some of you this week in the prayer times and in the small groups. So uh, it's great having Josh with us. He's going to lead us now in prayer. Uh, over the next few weeks, we'll see him in different times and different ways in the Sundays as well. But uh, it's now Josh is going to lead us in our prayers this morning. Thank you, Josh. Let's pray. Lord God, we want to pray for the millions of lives around the world being affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Lord, we pray for your peace and your comfort to all those who are isolated because of COVID, as well as all those grieving at this time. Lord, we pray that you'd be with them, that you'd comfort them. We also pray for wisdom for leaders worldwide as they seek to control this virus. Lord, give them the wisdom that only you can give. Also, we lift up our own national leaders to you, Lord, and we pray that you would lead them to make good decisions for all of the people in the UK. As we turn to our own circumstances, Lord, we pray for local schools finishing half term and we pray that as they go back, those who are going back in person would be safe, that the children, the staff and all the families involved, would you would protect them and you would keep them safe at this time, Lord. And we pray for those who are continuing homeschooling, Particularly we think of parents who are trying to do that as well as doing jobs and we pray that you would give them the energy and help them balance their time between those two responsibilities, Lord. And finally we pray for those we know personally who are struggling at this time with mental and or physical health difficulties, Lord. Right now, let's just speak someone aloud that we know who is struggling at this time. And Lord, we pray for whoever you've each said, Lord, may we, may we support them, may we equip them, may we stay in contact with them in this difficult time. Lord, may we pray that the people in our community would not feel isolated or alone but as we as the church would stay connected and that we connect with others who are suffering. Amen. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you Where your love ran red And my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you Jesus 
So as I said at the start of the service, we're starting a new series today. It's a five-week series, and it's based around five letter statements that come in Hebrews chapter 10. If you read, as we go into in a little while, that passage, you may only find three of them. But uh, my encouragement is that the last letter applies to three statements, and we'll go pick those up, and we're going to look at those over these next five Sundays. The book of Hebrews was written by... Well, actually, we don't really know who it was written by because uh, the author is unknown. Um, it doesn't anywhere state who it was that wrote it. And various scholars over the years have got their various opinions as to who scribed this, uh, this particular text. Whilst we don't know who wrote it, we do know who it was written to. And it was written to Jewish believers, those who were particularly struggling and experiencing persecution because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And so... It's uh, you know, really important for us to know that context because what comes and what we're going to be looking at today is in the context of a group of people that were really having a hard time of it. And these encouragements come not to people who were, were having a great time, but to those who are struggling. And it's really important that we recognise that. And so when, when we kind of look at these, these, these texts and these encouragements, these let us statements... That is, statements that have been written specifically for those facing a tough time. The writer draws very heavily on the Old Testament throughout the text, throughout these 13 chapters that we have of the book of Hebrews. And it's probably worth us mentioning therefore right at the start how he viewed the Old Testament. What is his uh, view of the Old Testament? How did he regard the Old Testament? The first thing to say is this. The Old Testament, as far as the writer of the book of Hebrews is concerned, is Christ centered through the pages of the old testament god is pointing towards the one who is coming to go ahead the coming the coming messiah thus one of the fascinating things about the prophetic voice in the old testament is that whilst there might have been a, a an immediate or a relatively immediate uh, fulfillment of that prophecy in so many cases there was a longer term fulfillment that was going to come in the coming of jesus in the coming of the messiah and so there was this understanding in the Old Testament prophetic books that one was going to come and was going to rescue his people. It may not have been noted by the immediate readers. They may not have had that perspective. But as we uh, are able to read back into the Old Testament, we, we can see not only the kind of immediate implications and understanding of the prophetic, but also this understanding that in Jesus these prophecies were ultimately fulfilled. For the writer to the Hebrews, who was writing, again, after Christ had been born and lived, he was able to look back, or he or she was able to look back and see how the Old Testament spoke of the one who was going to come, the one that uh, was coming, the Messiah, the Saviour of the world, Jesus Christ. And so everything about the Old Testament points to Jesus. And it's interesting to note that when you read Luke chapter 24 and the story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, that's how Jesus viewed the scriptures too. And so as he walked with his disciples on the road to Emmaus, he went through the Old Testament and he showed them time and time again how those Old Testament scriptures pointed to what he was doing, what he had fulfilled, the one who had come, how it had come, become fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And he used the Old Testament to, to, to teach them and to reveal that truth to them. The second thing to notice about the Old Testament as far as the writer to the Hebrews is concerned, and I would say it's also true for us today, is that it is so relevant. The Old Testament is not just a historical textbook. It is relevant to our lives today. We started right at the beginning of our service with a verse from a couple of verses from the book and the book of Psalms, a song that was written all those many years ago, still relevant for us today, still appropriate for us in our context today. And the teaching of God's covenant, the way he loved his people, the way he cared for his people, his, his faithfulness, his reliability, his love, all those themes that are kind of captured and expounded in the Old Testament are still relevant for us today. The writer to the Hebrews knew that. And so he, they, they relied very heavily on the Old Testament to, to uh, under, underpin all of that and to reveal that to us. So as we come to Hebrews 10, therefore, it's no surprise that 
what we find in Hebrews chapter 10 is language that is very much rooted in the Old Testament. It's, it's pictorial language which is rooted in the Old Testament and the tabernacle and the temple and the sacrificial system that was in place. Let's read, therefore, the book of the, the, this, this passage from Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to read the, all six verses that we're going to look at over these next uh, three weeks, although we're, today we're only going to focus on the first few verses of that. But let's read the whole section as it comes in Hebrews 10 from verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance of, that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. One of the greatest uh, writers and preachers of our nonconformist church history period, John Owen, summed up the verse we're looking at today, verse 22, with these words. He said, he said this, This phrase encompasses the whole performance of divine solemn worship as it was constantly expressed. We have in these verses an old way and we have a new way. We're going to focus on those together, unpacking the old way first because that's the language that we have and then unpacking what that means for us today. There are many parallels between what we have as, and what we experience as Christians with the Old Testament sacrificial system and the writer of the Hebrews leans on that and draws on that. So we have the means of approach. First of all, under the old sacrificial system, the approach uh, to the temple, to God, so to speak, was made through the offering of a sacrifice, a sheep or a goat, or if you were poor, then it would be a bird. It wasn't pretty, it wasn't pleasant, it was bloody and it was gory, but the message was clear. Sin is messy, sin is horrible, it is unpleasant, it is messy, and the, the kind of consequences of our sin has implications as well. Because of the nature of this approach to God, you weren't just able to, to pull up, walk in to the temple. You had to go into the fields. You had to go and think about what you were doing. You had to process what you're doing. You had to reflect on what you were, were about to do and go into the field and choose appropriately the animal that you needed to take with you. Once you had identified your animal and chosen your animal, you then had to, to lead that animal and take that animal to the temple, to the place where it, it was to be sacrificed. But man being man, used, uh, uh, soon made, made uh, a, a, a discovery. And that discovery was they could make money out of this. <laughs> and they could, uh, they could exploit what was going on. And so by the time we come to the New Testament and in Jesus' time, it became far more common, therefore, just to pull up to the temple and buy somebody else's sheep or goats or birds. Saved you the hassle, saved you having to go and find and choose your own, saved you losing out. Okay, you might pay a little bit more, but you then compensate for the time and effort that you've put in. So you just could pull up and buy what you wanted to buy that was being sold over and above the market rate. It saved a lot of hassle. It saved a lot of thought, it saved a lot of pain and, and heartache perhaps. You didn't have to sacrifice your favourite goat or your favourite sheep, somebody else's. And so it just became a very simple thing, but people made money out of that as we know when we look at the story of Jesus and how he turned over the, temple tab the tables in the temple. But the approach under the Old Testament sacrificial system, under the old way, was through animal sacrifice. What was the object of the approach? Well, the old, under the old system, you didn't draw near to God. You drew near to an object, a symbol of the presence of God. The Holy of Holies, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, was a symbol that God was present with his people. It was where uh, the, the, the Jews understood that, that God was and God met them. 
but they didn't have that understanding that God lived with them and lived among them. It was where God met them in the Holy of Holies, in this place, at this point. So what you came towards and what you came to was this, uh, this object, this symbol that represented God's presence with his people. And that's important to hold on to that. So it, became a, it was a symbol. The third thing, what is the limit? Because under the Old Testament sacrificial system, it was one priest once a year that was unable to go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. That was it. Everything else was done at arm's length. You had to be away from that actual real place where God really was present and really met his people, this place, this Ark of the Covenant. So there was a limit to how close you could come to God as the, as the under, Old Testament understood it. So let's read these verses again in the light of that old system. Let's, let's hold that as we read these verses again from Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Here we have a new and living way. It's a new way that's been opened up for us. A few pages earlier, in Hebrews chapter 7, the writer says this, the former regulation is set aside because it was weak. And useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. God set aside the old things, the former regulations, because they were weak and useless. They couldn't do it, they couldn't change it, they couldn't change the heart of man. And so they were set aside for a better hope, a better way by which we draw near to God. And we have that unpacked for us in these verses in Hebrews chapter 10. So we have the means of approach in this context and in this place. In Hebrews 10, what is the means of approach under the new, the new way? It's through the blood of Jesus. It wasn't an animal sacrifice any longer. It was a sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, once and for all. And through his sacrifice, our hearts are sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Our bodies are washed with pure water. We are made clean and made new because of the sacrifice that Jesus uh, bore, uh, bore and made on our behalf. The better hope is now not through an animal. It's not through a sheep, a goat, a, a bird. The better way, the better hope is through the blood of Jesus. This phrase, this heart sprinkled phrase that comes here in verse 22 is symbolic language describing an inward and, an, and a spiritual cleansing. It's that understanding that the Apostle Paul has where he says in uh, 2 Corinthians that we are made new, a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. This understanding of being made and created new comes out of this idea of being cleansed. The psalmist David of old wrote these words, Create in me a pure heart, O God. It didn't say just, just change and tweak it. We didn't need a new heart. And that's the understanding of this heart sprinkled phrase in verse 22. The body's washed is, again, symbolic language. If you go to the book of Ezekiel, we find in verse, uh, chapter 36, verse 25, that, that God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all impurities and from all idols. And then in the very next verse, he says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you. This symbolic language of having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us and from a guilty conscience and having this, our bodies washed with pure water, this is, the, this is the understanding that comes right out of the Old Testament into the new, this new way 
is not just about a superficial thing, it's about a significant, complete change. Creating a new heart, giving us a new heart. In chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, there are only a matter of, these, they, they are only a matter of food and drink, these are the rituals, and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. There is a new order now. These old things, these old ways were external rituals. Now it is about the heart. That's the new way. By the blood of Jesus, we have this new creation given us, a new heart that's given to us, and we're made new. So the means of us approaching God is through the death of Jesus, through the sacrifice of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus. And through that sacrifice, we are created new people. We are given a new heart, a pure heart. And he puts his spirit within us. So as we come, who are we drawing into? What's the object of our approach? Remember the old way? It was that symbolic representation that this is where God meets his people at the Ark of the Covenant. Now we meet a person. Let us draw near to God. Under the old way, people approached this sort of, uh, this tabernacle, the temple, this, this symbol of the presence of God. Through Jesus, we now meet God himself. Because when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. Opening up the way for us, not now to have to stand at a distance, but to be able to come close to him. And so the object and the limit of the approach is that we have now ready access, because the curtain has been torn from top to bottom through the blood of Jesus. Through his body, the curtain that was torn in two, we are now able to come with confidence into the most holy place. Do we recognise that? Do we understand that? Do we appreciate the fact that we now have this ready access into the very throne room of God? There is no curtain holding us back, preventing us from coming near. We are able to come right into the throne room of God. Not just a symbol of God's presence, but actually to meet with God himself face to face. And so in the light of that, the writer encourages us to do two things. He says, come to God, draw near to God. A few years ago, I was uh, very privileged to, back in 2008, and very privileged to be invited to Clarence House to meet the Prince of Wales um, as part of the Hope uh, 08 initiative. You know, that was a real honour and a real privilege and, you know, not one I take for granted. We have been invited, folks, not just to Clarence House, but into the most holy place. The most holy place. We've been invited not just to meet and greet the Prince of Wales, not just to, to stay in the sort of outer rooms where we were. You know, we didn't get to meet into his sort of personal residence we got into the bit that everyone goes into if you're going to meet him. But you're told where you can and where you can't go and you're kind of shown in and you're shown out. We've been invited into the very presence of God himself, into where he resides, into the very most private and intimate places where God is. That's where God's invited us to meet him. Not keeping us at arm's length, not keeping us outside. This is the sovereign God who draws near to us and invites us to draw near to him. As I was reflecting on that invitation, there, are, there could have been a number of responses from me. I could have had uh, a sense of pride that, well, I don't actually need to go to meet the Prince Charles. I'm actually okay. Thank you. I don't need to do that. Part of me could have been, in me, a sense of I'm not worthy. Why me? I know I've got an invitation, but I don't feel worthy to go and meet. I don't really want to put myself in that position because I don't feel that I have anything to offer. I might have been too busy. I might have made some excuses about my diary being too full and, and not cleared other things out 
too many demands on my time, too many questions that I have, too many things I have to deal with. Or perhaps I was concerned about what other people might think of me. You know, those same four things still apply today and prevent us from drawing near to God. Pride. I'm okay, actually. I don't really need to come to God. I can kind of do it on my own. I'm, I'm okay. I'm not that bad. Sin. Well, the stuff in my life, if, if, if God really knew what I was like, he wouldn't want any part of me. I'm just not worthy to meet with him. The distractions of busyness. Well, I'll do it when I've stopped doing other things. Well, when I perhaps get to retirement age, I might stop and think about it at that point. When I've started making some money and I'm comfortable, then I'll think about it. Well, I'll do it when another day. Things of this world distract us. And perhaps even the influence of other people, or what are they going to think of me? And so for these same four reasons, we don't draw near to God. We don't accept that invitation that he extends to you and I today to come close to him and to draw near to him. The writer to the book of Hebrews cuts through all of that. And he says, you know, do you know what? We can come near to him and we should come near to him to draw near to the God, to come into the very presence of him who invites us. Let us do it. Let's not make excuses. But the second thing is, he says, do it with a sincere heart. We don't come all brash and arrogant thinking we're okay. We come recognising and acknowledging our inadequacies and our weaknesses. We come recognising that as with David, we need God to give us a new heart. We come recognising our, 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 our brokenness and our failings, crying out to God to, to create us new people, to remove that heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh, to put his spirit in us. And as we come in that place of humility, in that sincerity of heart, we find forgiveness, we find cleansing, we find that washing of pure water. And we find our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. This is how we draw near to God. We come close to him. As we close, there's a, very much a shout out to, in that te text to what we believe is baptism. Because it talks in that in those texts about this, this cleansing that comes in the water. Now, when we baptise people, we don't believe the water cleanses in the same way but it's symbolic of this, this very act that's recorded in this book of Hebrews. These very words that come from Hebrews, this is what happens in baptism. This is what we symbolise in baptism. As you go into the water, it is symbolising that we have had our hearts washed and cleansed and we have been made new. And it may well be that some of you watching this need to be baptised. As you know, we can't currently do that but we will be doing it very soon when we can get back into the building. And maybe it's time to make a decision that, okay, it's not now, but as soon as it is possible, you want to be baptised because that's a significant act on your part to acknowledge that you have put your trust in God, you have drawn near to him with a sincere heart and he has given you that new heart. So if that's for you, please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you and talk to you about that and, and share with you what that looks like and keep you posted as, as to when we can uh, have a baptismal service. But there is a new way. There is a better way. There is a, a way now which is uh, a new hope that we have. We don't have to go and live under the old way any longer. That has been set aside because it's broken. It didn't work. There's only one way now, and that is through Jesus Christ. And as we come to him, he gives us this new heart. He gives us this new, makes us this new, these new people. He puts his spirit within us. We do this not because we're forced to. We yield to him not because we have to, but because you and I are, are invited by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to come into the very 
most holy place, into the very uh, the heart of where he is. He invites us in and he says, come. Come just as you are. Come. I hope and pray that as we hear these words, whether we've been a Christian for 50 years, whether we're not a Christian yet, we will still receive that invitation to come, to draw near to him, to not let the things of this world distract us, to let our experiences put put us off, but we will draw near to him and meet with him. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much that you invite us to draw near to you as you draw near to us. Thank you that it's not something that we have to do on our own. Thank you that you've already made it possible, that you've already come close to us. And as you draw, have drawn near to us, as you've made it possible through Jesus, through his sacrifice for us, thank you that we can enter into uh, your presence. I pray that for each one of us watching this service, listening to these words, Lord, that they won't just be words. We, for some of us, we may know these words. We've heard them many times before. We've read them many times. We've used them. We've spoken them out before. Father God, by your spirit, may these words come alive again for us today. May we be overwhelmed by the privilege of being invited by the King of Kings to come into the most holy place. What an awesome, awesome privilege that is. Thank you. And so, Father, we pray that we would come as we are. Some of us have hang-ups, some of us have issues that we're still trying to wrestle with and deal with, but we come with those hang-ups. Some of us have doubts, some of us have fears. We come with those fears, with those doubts, but we come to you. This morning again, Father God, we draw near to you. And we thank you for that new way open for us through Jesus. We offer you our worship and our prayers. We offer you ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing our final song, which says, Draw me close to you. And it's a reminder that that God has already come close to us. And uh, when we sing this, we're just inviting him uh, just to uh, reveal himself to us. You're all I need. You're all I've ever wanted. It's a real sense in which we have this privilege to draw near to one who has already drawn near to us. So let's sing this as we close our service. Draw me close to you.
close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire will do Cause nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find a way Bring me back to you Thank you for joining with us again this morning. We're going to close with the words of the grace. We do this and done this last few uh, few months now. And again, as we said before, as we say these words, just picture in your heart and mind those in our church community, those around us, that perhaps you want to speak these words over and into their lives as a real prayer of blessing upon them. So let's pray together. May the God, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Again, thank you for watching. Thank you for joining with us. If you would like any information about the church, you want to know more about the Christian faith, you want to know more what it means to, to draw near to God, you want to know more about baptism, whatever it may be, whatever questions you've got, please do get in touch. There's an email address there, a phone number, and our website as well is all addresses that are also there, and you can access information there too. So thank you. God bless you. And join us next Sunday as we continue our series. In these, with these letter statements from Hebrews 10.